Hi, my name is Lee Nish, pastor of Sparks United Methodist Church. Welcome to worship. And welcome to the series of messages entitled, Wrestling with Doubt, Finding Faith. And today, we're going to take a look at one of the essential questions of the Christian faith. Actually, it's a question that anybody has, whether they're uh, Christian or non-Christian, atheist, agnostic. People really want to know, is the Bible true? And just as centuries ago we had the age of enlightenment, which gave birth to the age of reason, I believe you could say that the 21st century is really the age of doubt. With all of the information bombarding on us, some of which may align more with truth, a lot of it probably aligns more with prevarication, we're always questioning what the veracity is of the information coming at us. Is it true? And naturally, that bleeds over into our reading of the Bible. In fact, uh, since the Age of Enlightenment, most of us have been reading the Bible as if it were a newspaper and not understanding the different nuances in terms of the literature in the Bible so that when we ask, is it true, what we're really asking is, is did this really happen? Is it historical? So we're going to take a look at that and uh, in the broader sense, is the Bible true and how can we really read the Bible and make sense of it. All that in the next few minutes. Thank you for joining us in worship. Sergeant, today I'll be reading from Psalm and 2 Timothy. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. There's a gray river of doubt Between my head and my heart They say see is believing But I only see myself Reflected in the currents Of the great unknown I need a savior 
So as we sit down to either read the newspaper or social media or however it is that we're getting our information, uh, we kind of tend back to the old dragnet Joe Friday's phrase, uh, just the truth, ma'am, just the truth, give me the truth, uh, just the facts. And what we want to do is just know the facts about what it is and cut, just cut straight to the chase. Well, if we think about the journey towards literature and through literature, we know that you have to spend time with literature, with, with poetry, uh, looking at meanings. And the Bible, so the Bible doesn't really just read like a newspaper. Uh, and uh, we get this, I get this a lot from, uh, from people, not only in my congregation, but outside who say, well, there's so much in the Bible, not only that I don't understand, but that I just can't believe. Uh, in fact, this thing about God inventing and creating the world in six days, really? Did he really do that? And did he do that just, uh, what, six, six million years ago when science tells us something completely different? And what about that story of Jonah? Was he really swallowed by a whale or by a big fish? And how big did the fish have to be to swallow Jonah? And well, you, you, pretty much you see, when you start reading the Bible as if it's a newspaper and just reporting the facts, you kind of lose the sense of the meaning of a lot of what the Bible is saying. And so there have been a variety of ways that people have read the Bible. And uh, up until a couple centuries ago, I, I think that there was more of a sense of trying to understand the Bible in, in its own context. But uh, at some point, this was in the rise of fundamentalism, uh, and particularly our conservative churches, our evangelical conservative churches, they developed a, a, a sense or a theory of inerrancy. In other words, every word in the Bible has to be correct. And so you don't question the Bible. And in fact, if you have questions, you probably don't belong in this congregation. And even worse than that, if you have questions, you don't belong in the Christian faith because you can't question anything that the Bible says. Is that really so? Well, many of us don't think so. Many of us who have lived over the past uh, several decades where a lot of critical thinking has taken place, particularly in developing tools to read the Bible, but, uh, but what we try to do is to avoid the, what you would call the doctrine of inerrancy, which depends on verbal plenary inspiration. And what that means is that, um, that God spoke every single word to a human being who wrote it down accurately, and that became the scriptures. In other words, there was no discretion whatsoever uh, for people to interpret what they thought God was saying or who they thought God was or how they understood Israel. There was no room for interpretation at all. The, the doctrine of inerrancy says the Bible is exactly what God spoke and therefore we must read with reverence the words in the Bible and understand each word to be absolutely accurate. Well, there are different ways of understanding truth. Um, accuracy and facts are one way, but many of us think that the Bible is more of biography than it is of inerrancy. Let me just give you an example. Um, I'm a big fan of biographies, and uh, not only to, to read biographies written by other folks, authors of different people, but also um, on PBS, uh, I love uh, the work of documentaries. I think it's fascinating to, uh, to watch a frontline program or uh, uh, great performances uh, and take a look at some of the artists or some of the current figures in politics and government in the arts and have people's take on who they are and how they came to create. Is that biography the total undisputed truth of the character that's being written about? Well, probably not, but is it close enough to give us an impression of who they are and importantly, how to understand what their work has been? Absolutely. And I think that that's what happens when we read the Bible. If we read it and press it for accuracy, historicity, and facts, we soon see the depth and the breadth of, the, of spiritual matters being diminished 
into simply right or wrong or true or false. On the other hand, if we read it as biography, we're understanding that we're learning more about the characters and perhaps more about what they faced and how they dealt with it. For instance, going back to uh, the, uh, the story of Jonah and the whale, we don't necessarily want to measure how large the whale was or what happened to have the whale spew Jonah out after three days or in fact, how did he even survive for three days in the belly of a whale? All of that is not germane to the meaning of the book. It's only four chapters and it's understood to be Hebrew poetry. It's written as a poem, a prophetic poem, not as a series of accurate events. And in fact, not unlike what we're talking about even in this series of sermons with regard to wrestling with doubt, finding faith, that was actually descriptive of what was happening to Jonah. Jonah was wrestling with God. He was wrestling with doubt that God was actually calling him to do something. And when, and when uh, Jonah, the, the book of Jonah describes the character Jonah as spending three days in the belly of the whale, I think what that really is, is Jonah spent days wrestling with God, doubting that God was actually calling him to go and speak to the Ninevites, enemies of God, and trying to convert them into, uh, into the Hebrew faith. We actually end up reading the rest of Jonah and finding out that Jonah finally relents and says, okay, God, just to spite you, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna preach your, your name to the Ninevites just to prove that they will not be converted. Jonah goes, preaches to the Ninevites, every last one converts. And what does that tell us about God? What it tells us is God never gives up on us. God never gives up on those who we understood to be Israel's enemies, enemies of the Hebrew people. God didn't want Nineveh, or God did not want Nineveh to be lost. God did not want Jonah to give up on Nineveh. God doesn't want us to give up on anybody who we might perceive as enemies. Do you see the difference in how we read the story of Jonah? One being just facts, history, the other being prophetic poetry and understanding a deeper meaning behind the struggle that Jonah was having, a struggle with God, and perhaps even as you and I struggle with our own doubts. And so let's get back to maybe some helpful comments on how we might approach the Bible. How do we make sense of this book, or in fact, all of the books in the Bible, because much of what we're reading is meant to be literature. It's not meant to be read as a newspaper or historical fact. So I've got some ideas that I wanna share with you that, uh, that will help us approach the Bible and read it seriously. The first is read all scripture through the lens of Jesus. You know, the Gospel of John says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and He became light, a light unto the nations. It is through the light of Jesus that you and I read the biblical texts. And we can discern through that light which texts seem to be more aligned with who Jesus understood God to be rather than perhaps a God who was trapped by people of a different culture in a different age. For instance, there are some texts in the Hebrew Bible that uh, claim to be historical that would have God not only destroy entire nations, but also women and children. I ask you, is, is that understanding of God consistent with who we see Jesus to be and how Jesus' light shining on God informs us of who God is? And so, as Christians, we would normally approach the Bible, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, by looking at it through the lens of Jesus. Everything that we read, anything that we try to understand, does it align with Jesus' understanding? You know, even Jesus uh, disagreed with some of the Old Testament texts when in chapter six of Matthew, during his Sermon on the Mount, he says, you have heard that it was said of old, 
but now I say unto you. In other words, he was quoting Old Testament scripture, but now he has a different take on those topics. And that's what he's informing people of in the Sermon on the Mount. And so even Jesus has gone through this metamorphosis and Jesus is asking us to do the same. The second uh, item that I would suggest is that we want, when we approach scripture, we want to remember the gist of the great commandments and the golden rule. You'll remember that when Jesus was asked, well, what's the greatest commandment of all? He said, well, actually there are two commandments. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. On this hang all of the law and all of the prophets. If, uh, if you feel an urge to do something that's gonna hurt a neighbor or hurt somebody else, you have to go back to this great commandment and say, is that, is that really what God's will is for my life? Is that, does that have anything to do with the great commandment? Uh, you might wanna review it in John chapter eight. Jesus found a woman who was being accused of adultery and she was about to be stoned by the religious authorities. And so he just simply looked at the authorities and he said, okay, fine, you wanna stone this woman, uh, go ahead, but just make sure that any of you have not committed sin. In other words, if you committed a sin, don't throw a stone. For those of you who are sinless, go ahead, throw the first stone. Do you know that all those religious people left? Now in the Old Testament, you're supposed to stone adulteresses. And they were there to just follow the law of Moses. But Jesus had a different idea. For Jesus, mercy trumped the law. And he turned to the woman and he said, where are your accusers? She said, well, they've all gone away. Jesus said, well, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. This is Jesus's new take on what had previously been understood to be a much more rigid set of rules. The great commandment gives us greater insight into what God's will is in terms of how we treat our neighbor, do unto others as we would have them do unto us. The third is this, see themes of love, compassion, justice, and mercy. If we are not about those four values, if we are not about being moved by compassion to help someone else, if we are not moved by mercy to forgive someone, if we're not moved by justice to try to right the wrongs in our society, if we're not moved by love, a selfless love, a love that doesn't claim anything for ourselves, but self-sacrificially claims for somebody else, if those four values are not present, and what we're understanding the scripture to be telling us, maybe we have to press harder or at least we have to ask questions because this is not the kind of interpretation that Jesus would have had to have us have when it comes to the scriptures. Fourth is discuss and debate with faithful friends. I don't know of how many of you have tried to read the Bible on your own. Now I actually read the Bible on my own through a time of devotion, but I always read someone's take on that scripture and how they have experienced it in their own life. I use the Upper Room Daily Devotional quite a bit, and I commend that to you, but I also commend the gathering of family and friends to share their understanding of the scripture that you're being, that you are wanting to read because it is through mutual interpretation that we get to a deeper faith. And sometimes the more isolated we are, the less likely we're going to get to a deeper faith and the more we just hold on to our own prejudices. And so I commend to you discuss and debate with faithful friends. Uh, the fifth is use reason and experience to study scripture. Um, as we mentioned before with the Wesleyan quadrilateral, tradition, experience, and reason, all three of those should inform how we read scripture. And uh, just as we've often said, when, when we come to the scripture, we don't check our minds at the door, we engage our minds because the gift of reason is one of the greatest gifts that God has given us. The gift of our experience, particularly as years have gone by, and we've seen how the Holy Spirit has worked in our lives, and in the lives of others, our experience becomes more and more informative about how we interpret 
the scriptures that we find in the Bible. And then finally, we pray to the Holy Spirit to guide us. I always like to invoke the, the presence of the Holy Spirit every day. I have the prayer to the Holy Spirit that I read that helps me understand that I am part of God's continuing creation. And part of that continuing creation is my continuing wrestling through doubt, building a deeper faith through my understanding, interpretation, and reinterpretation of the scriptures. I wouldn't even try to do that without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so I would just suggest this simple, humble prayer to you as you approach the Holy Scriptures. And finally, I just, uh, I just want to suggest this. This is a, a colander that I actually just pulled out of our church kitchen and uh, kind of an industrial sized uh, colander. And what this does is you, you know, whatever food you're preparing, you place the food in there and certain of the waste products that you don't want remaining kind of fall through the cracks. And what you, are ended, what you end up with is more of a distilled uh, food that is ready to be prepared and eaten. Well, it's the, the colander of reason, experience, and tradition that I'm suggesting you sift the scriptures through. Ask hard questions. Ask questions that, that maybe uh, the Spirit is calling you to ask and dig more deeply. Because sometimes the surface understanding of scripture will lead us in the wrong direction. As I've often said, you can make scripture say anything you want it to say. But for people who are willing to wrestle with doubt and dig more deeply, those are the people who are going to be able to sift out the bad stuff and be able to appreciate the scripture. My final word to you is this. Do not be too anxious to simply dismiss scripture with which you disagree. Sometimes the scripture with which we disagree or we find problems in may tell us more about our own preference or our own fears than what it does about the scripture itself. I'm not suggesting that we just jettison any scripture, but I'm suggesting that we really seriously work through our questions so that when we come out the other end, we may have a better appreciation for how our interpretation and reading of the scripture aligns with Jesus and Jesus' intent on bringing God's truest picture, the word made flesh, into your life and into mine. All throughout my history Faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring And every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of goodness all over my life all over my life I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life all over my life help me remember when I'm weak Heart to victory You are my strength And you always will be I see the evidence of your goodness All of my life All of my life I see your promises in fulfillment all of my life, all of my life See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless All my sins rolled away, because of you, oh Jesus I see the 
evidence of your goodness all of my life, all of my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all of my life, all of As we go to prayer, we ask that God hear us, whether we are wrestling with our doubts or whether we're a strong believer. We know, and sometimes we don't know, that God is with us. God, we ask you to hear our unbelief, hear our doubts, make your presence known to us. Help us to hear and see the evidence of you in our lives. Be with us as we pray a different version of a prayer you taught us to say when we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Hear us as we pray and be with us. Amen. Some of the most profound poetry that I find in Scripture, I find in the book of Psalms. And I can't tell you how often I have comforted families with Psalm 23, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, do not fear evil, for God is with you. God's rod and staff, they comfort you. And in John chapter 14, Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid, for I go and prepare a place for you. My Father's house has many mansions, many rooms, and I will return and take you with me to those rooms. That is, uh, that is hope, that is poetry, and it may not be able to be resolved clearly into fact, but I cannot tell you how frequently people respond to scripture bathed in the Holy Spirit to comfort them and give them the assurance of a hopeful future. I hope that I can say that of you and that this message will bring you a better understanding of the truthfulness of the Bible. Please allow the Spirit to be a blessing to you that you may be a blessing to the world. Go change the world. Thanks for joining us here at Sparks UMC. You can connect and join the conversation on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. To receive the weekly emails that share what's happening in the Sparks UMC community, scan the QR code on the screen, or let us know by filling out the Connect card on our website. If you would like prayer, email us at sparksumcprayers at gmail.com or scan the code. We are grateful for your support of the ministry the mission of Sparks UMC. We'll see you next time. Be blessed.